Well, good afternoon to all of you and thank you for joining us to the third session in our Career Development for Researchers in Southeast Asia webinar series. And we are really on the way to scoring a hat-trick today. We already had two fabulous sessions in this series. The first one all about how to write a successful PhD proposal. Then I'm sure lots of you joined us for our first session about science communication. And today we have invited a third expert speaker who will talk to us about video. Now, why is this important? You all know as much as I do, we have the corona pandemic still keeping us in its grip. And one of the uh, fallouts for us is that we cannot travel and researchers are affected. You cannot travel to uh, a conference, you cannot meet potential collaborators. You can also not go and explore, for example, uh, an opportunity to work on a PhD uh, project. More often than not, you'll be asked nowadays to present yourself, not physically by traveling, but virtually by producing, for example, a short video about yourself or by joining a video conference where you have a, a certain amount of time to get the essence of what is you and what are your ideas across and make a good impression. And this is difficult, as we all know. So we've invited today an expert speaker. His name is John Janssens, and he's joining us this afternoon from Brussels in Belgium. And he will share with us his advice on how to make sure that you come across in the best possible way when you present yourself and your scientific ideas via video. So just a little bit of information about John. John has a background in publishing and in editorial work. He also has experience in copywriting and script writing for advertising and corporate videos. And most importantly, he is the creative director at a communications agency called Comana. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, that is based Sorry. in Brussels. And I believe he's also a musician by training. So That's correct. before I hand over to, to John, just a, a few um, a words of housekeeping. This is, of course, we're trying to be as interactive as possible with you. If you uh, see on your um, right hand side, there is a chat function and there's also a questions function. So whenever you have a question, you want to say something to John, please type your question. Myself and my colleague uh, Jenny will be making sure that John gets your question and he will answer to you. This is a session that will also be recorded. We will post the video later on on our YouTube channel and you will also receive a copy of the slides along with a certificate of attendance. And I think with this, this is enough from me. I will hand over to you, John, and I wish all of you a fabulous session. Thank you, Suzanne. And hello uh, to all near and far. Let's uh, dive in. So this is uh, indeed my presentation uh, entitled a Video is King. Now forgive the slightly pompous title, but it was uh, devised by some digital marketing people. And um, in, the, in the discipline of digital marketing, it's commonly acknowledged nowadays that video is just more sticky in terms of engaging your audience, in terms of converting online um and 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 um and uh yeah retaining attention it performs better than text or um images or audio for that matter hence the the title of this presentation as suzanne said yes i'm a videographer video and virtual events producer based in brussels uh, and I have to say, I'm a little bit of an imposter. I suffer from imposter syndrome uh, in video because I came to it quite late, actually. I I've, I've now have six years experience, but um, doing you know, video production, animation, motion design, that sort of thing. But uh, prior to that, I was uh, active in publishing. Uh, I'd studied international affairs and history, and I'm a jazz musician and songwriter by training. So not exactly your traditional route into, into video. But this is just to say that there's no uh, there's no good way of stepping into video, and there are a lot of segues and possible uh, alternative routes that you can take. So hopefully you can gain from my experience as well, and you might find that you know a lot more than you than you think you do. If you're if you have even like a passing interest in photography, for example, 
uh, or music, you'll see that there are a lot, a lot of commonalities there. Uh, to make this presentation interactive, I was hoping to use a Mentimeter um, just to have a little fun. We can have a quiz as well, so jump on board. I'll give you guys a minute. If you have your phones handy, you can just uh, scan the, the QR code um, or open another tab in your browser and enter the eight-digit code that you see on your screen. I'll give you guys just a few seconds to do that, and then we'll continue. I want to ask you this first question on the Menti. How much uh, video recording experience do you actually have right now? Um, because I, I'm thinking that with the pandemic in the last 12 months, maybe some people have taken to video in a big way. Um, okay. But so mostly none. So we, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get into all the basics right here. So don't, don't worry about that. All right, good. I like to, to I like to share this picture. It's a it's a shot um, from the making of a movie by Steven Soderbergh called Unsane, back in 2018. So this is almost uh, three years old, uh, and the movie was entirely shot on iPhone, which was the uh, the defining feature, uh, just using this gimbal here. And it's this is to say that the technology was ripe three years ago, uh, and it kind of made producers out out of all of us. We have this great technology in our hands now, and we just need to kind of know how to use it. And I'm going to go through some, some basic tips to get you uh, up to speed with what we can do nowadays. Um, essentially, the, the phones and the, the cameras on the phones were, were perfected already three years ago, or even five years ago. Uh, phones were capable of recording HD video. What really had to follow and what wasn't quite in place yet, but is now, I'd say is longer battery life on phones. This is critical because video is really hungry in terms of battery. Uh, so you need longer battery life, you need storage capacity, which phones didn't have so much, but they do have now. Um, and also cloud storage is great. You can immediately upload your these bulk off for further editing, for further sharing. So things like network connectivity, bandwidth, uh, battery life, storage, all this really helped. And now we really have all our ducks in place to, to, to produce great content quite easily. The outline of my presentation. So we're going to go into things like uh, lighting, background, framing. These are general notions of photography that apply to video as well. Um, and the good thing about these first three chapters of the presentation is that they're really just things that you can conceptualize and get to grips with and that require no investment on your part. I mean, you can apply these techniques just using your phone um, or your laptop, as we'll, we'll talk about later. Uh, then we'll have a short quiz on 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 these on this theory that we covered, and then we'll talk about audio stabilization, uh, asynchronous video communication, which is just just a fancy word to say um, pre-recorded kind of video messages, uh, and then we'll go through making a video from A to Z very quickly. All right. So lighting is my first topic now. Um, this is really sh should be the first thing you think about because without light you don't get uh, anything. Uh, light is really the oxygen for your lens, um, so it gives kind of the contours to your shapes. It gives the colors, the dimensions, the shadows. All that is, is interplay of light, and you and uh, without it, well, there's very little information um, to process for your for your lens. In this case, on the left, you see a a, um, a picture of um, something that was underexposed. So the, 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 the contours of the buildings aren't, aren't so um, apparent and so obvious. And contrary on the, on the right, uh, an overexposed image where everything is what we call uh, burned in the picture, uh, quite literally burned to a crisp and, uh, and burned to white in this case. So all the color pixels uh, just turn to white. And this is, there's, there's no amount of editing you can do in post-production to retrieve the, the lost color here. Um, fortunately, actually, nowadays phones do a good job of, uh, of automatically hand, handling ISO so that you don't have this exposure problem. Um, this is an example of good lighting coming in from at an angle and bouncing off the subject uh, in kind of an interview, kind of a talking heads format. Uh, what you want to do is you have your main light at 10 or 2 o'clock when you're, when you're facing someone, if you're interviewing someone else or even for yourself. 
uh, your light source should be at 2 or 10 o'clock, um, as in this case, for example. See this, uh, the, 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 the shooting with a, a, a mobile phone, and the light is coming in from this bay window, which is quite large and just flooding in nicely and giving you a, a lot of light from the, from the back. What you don't want to do is to have your light coming in into the lens directly from a, uh, to be backlit, so to, so to speak. Uh, there are some accessories that you can look into that can help. Um, I've actually got a light here that's bouncing off my wall um, that you can just have a look here. So I'm fairly well lit and I've got this little neon, sorry, there in the back, this little neon blue light as well, just to give me a little bit of a background ambiance uh, light, but mostly it's a, a main light that's here on my right and that's bouncing off the front wall, which is white and, re and reflecting on me. Um, so that I'm well lit vis-a-vis -vis my background, which is more, which is a little bit darker. Uh, I'm also using a uh, DSLR camera, a Canon camera, rather than my webcam, which gives me a, a better picture normally than a traditional, you know, onboard webcam on your laptop. Uh, there are some gadgets that you should try and avoid. Anything that costs, you know, five or ten bucks on Amazon. You should probably stay away from. This won't really add anything to the to the mix. Uh, the second thing I want to talk about is background. After after lighting, it's something else that you should consider when you walk into a room or if you're filming yourself at the office. Um, these are good examples. On the left, you have a, a nutritionist covering a, a you know a nutrition, food, and bev kind of topic. And you, well, first of all, I, I should say when I say background, I mean background, but I also mean foreground and any kind of props that you use. So anything that's not your main subject is considered uh, quote unquote background. And uh, in this case, on the left, you want it to be kind of crisp and fresh, and that's what they've gone for. Very uh, luminous, bright, um, and fresh, because that kind of makes sense uh, with the topic. On the right, you have uh, what is, I think, a music executive. Um, and again, his background is kind of, it supports the narrative, right? It's telling you that um, this guy has platinum records, um, that he's a successful record producer or record exec. Um, the light in the room is slightly darker than on the left. It's more, um, it's more cozy, I'd say. And you've got all these record contracts here uh, uh, in, um, sitting on his desk, stacked nicely. Um, this is an example of a background, I'd, I'd say, gone wrong, because in this case, it's very much... Uh, a case where the, the background kind of took over the story. So rather than driving the narrative and supporting it, it took on its own narrative. Um, and I'll give you the context. So this was Emmanuel Macron, the French president, um, talking about, uh, or at least addressing the nation after protests in France, violent protests at times, about um, um, higher taxes, I think, that were levied uh, and that caused social unrest. And the last thing you want to do is project an image of, of opulence and wealth uh, when you're trying to to to, um, to have your constituents swallow a, a you know a bumped up tax rate, um, so yeah, this this picture came to be known as the man with the golden desk more than anything else. So that was that was probably not so good from a PR point of view. And the other thing I want to say about this picture, and it's the other thing you should be mindful of with background, is that the devil is really in the details. So um, I was quite astounded actually to see this cable dangling over here. Uh, on the left, you know, for, for such a, a presidential image to leave that and even these cables back there. Uh, it's just kind of untidy and it's it's surprising that they would have left that in the shot uh, at this level, of, you know, for a picture of this caliber. This is something that we shot uh, outdoors because we were lucky enough that it was a, a beautiful spring afternoon. And um, I want to show you very quickly, this uh, this video over here. So yeah, before before I show it, I should just tell you that it was um, shot for Europe a Bio. Uh, it was it was on biotechnology, and the topic I think was very much sustainability. That was very much the message that was being delivered. It was about sustainable uh, sustainability and sustainable policies, and. Um, so it made sense to be filming this outside in a kind of lush green background with the sun kind of bouncing off the, 
uh, the canopy over here. And there's also a car that passes by and you have the leaves that are gently rustling as you'll see. And it's a good idea if you have, some, if you have a static person in, in, a, in a kind of talking heads interview kind of format where there's not too much action, uh, it's a good idea to have a little movement in the background just to, to make it more dynamic. And, um, and that's, what, that's what we have here. You see the leaves gently rustling, the car in the background. And then here in this shot, it's a second camera that's kind of close on the, on the subject. Uh, and it creates this shallow depth of field. So in the background, you can see the leaves. It's almost like an abstract uh, green background that's moving, which is quite, quite nice. Okay, so back to, um, to the presentation. Um, another example of a, of a background here, I, I like to show this picture because uh, essentially the subject here is detached from the back wall. You want to try and do that as much as possible. If you're going to film yourself or someone else, you don't want to be too close to your, um, to your back wall because that creates kind of an oppressive uh, kind of mood to, to your picture and it's just not very flattering. It's better to get as much space between you or your subject and the back wall as possible. Here there's about four four or five meters, uh, and you can get that nice sort of shallow depth of field as well. So whether your background is blurry and the subject is in focus. This is a, an example just to show you a concept we call leading lines. And leading lines are essentially the, the lines that your brain, your mind kind of creates subconsciously. So you, the, you, you're always, when you're processing a picture, your, your brain is always kind of trying to order things. And the first thing it'll do is identify your subject uh, here, who's nicely outlined, and then to make a sense of the background, your brain will kind of look for these lines, uh, and you want them to be kind of harmonious and parallel and you know, moving in one direction. This is an example of kind of background gone wrong, and the leading lines are kind of all over the place. I just I did the exercise of trying to figure out where they where they were, and as you can see, nothing is is really. Uh, Per perpendicular or parallel, you know, there's no parallel motion. It's kind of all over the place. And the subject is probably too close to the back wall as well in this case. This is better. You can see also that the gaze of the person is moving like this. So it's parallel to the lines of the bookshelves here in the background. And this is the, just a picture of, um, to show you what you can do when you're not working with much because there's not much going on in the room or in the background. Uh, generally, rule of thumb is just, you know, less is more. So with the background, if you, if you just have a nice white wall to work with, it's not a bad idea. And there's a plant as well. Um, so, you know, you, you want to try and get into a situation where you, your background is at least not too distracting and clean. That's kind of your basics. So after lighting and background, I want to talk about framing. Um, maybe a question for you guys, if you want to just drop in the chat, what do you think? Uh, should you be filming portrait or landscape if you're using your phone? If you guys have any opinion, you can just drop that in the chat here. Um, Yeah, I hear. La I see landscape. Uh, anyone else have an idea, an opinion? Well, I'll tell you. I'll just uh, go ahead and tell you that landscape indeed is probably preferable because uh, let's see why. This is what ends up happening if you shoot in uh, portrait mode and your video is given to an editor. You see what's happening here is, um, and, and this is a trick that editors use, and they thought they were quite clever by, by doing this. Um, because on, if, you, if you look at a YouTube video like this, or any kind of uh, uh, video player usually supports this kind of format for, for showing video, because uh, I mean, there's a simple explanation. If you look at monitors, 
be it TV or your laptop monitors or second secondary screens, they are in this kind of a landscape 16 by nine format rather than portrait, right? They're, they're not upright, they're, they're kind of elongated. Um, so if you get this kind of video, uh, the editor then, he duplicates the video and blurs it on either side. Um, and by, by blurring it, he, he then uh, uses it as a layer and fills in the whole screen. So you get this kind of result. But it's far from ideal in my, in my opinion. I mean, it's kind of, you get this lost information on the left and the right, and the video is kind of squeezed in between. It's not particularly nice. So you want to shoot um, uh, landscape if you can. There are some instances where shooting portrait makes sense. Um, particularly if you're doing an Instagram story or Facebook, they have certain templates uh, and certain formats that they use. So you want to check those formats. Um, they could be square or they could be slightly portrait mode. So really depending on your use, if you know what you're doing, you can go ahead and shoot portrait. But uh, generally, uh, rule of thumb, again, if you're not too sure or if, if your video will be used on multiple platforms, uh, shoot in landscape. And the second question I want to I want to ask is um, here. Have a look at these two pictures. What do you, what do you see really in terms of what's going on here? Um, they do look kind of similar. Uh, they're both talking heads, but if you look closely on the, the picture on the left here, the subject is actually facing the camera, looking into the lens directly. Over here, he's slightly off to one side uh, and looking slightly off camera. And this is actually um, these are intentional in both cases, and they just produce different results. If you're looking into camera, it's probably more suitable for like addressing an audience with a direct message. Um, it has a more immediate feel, whereas this is more like a dialogue between two people. It feels more conversational, more intimate, because you can, although you don't see the second person on screen, in this case, maybe the interviewer or the, uh, the conversationalist, you, you do get an idea, this notion that um, he is talking to someone rather than talking to the camera directly or to you. So it almost feels like you're eavesdropping with the camera over here on the, on the conversation between two people. So this is good for like interview, documentaries, or, or long any kind of long form production. And this is good, as I said, for more of a direct address, a sales pitch, or like a short impactful statement. If you're looking into the camera, your setup will be something like this with your light source always to one side and you behind the camera and your subject looking into the camera. And this is your final frame and you're generally centered in, the, in this uh, scenario. And let's have a look at uh, what that would look like in video form. notre efficience sans jamais rogner sur la qualité de prise en charge de nos patients. C'est quelque chose de fondamental et quelque chose qui nous unit tous au niveau européen. The expectations for me are to meet peers, uh, to share practices, uh, to hear uh, problems, but especially solutions. Okay. And... Um... If you're looking off camera, it'll look something like this. Your light source to one side, your camera over here, and you're just sitting right next to it, as close as you can actually to the camera so that the gaze of the person is just is just off. You don't want it to be too far. You don't want to be sat too far away from your, from your camera. You want it to, to be just off like this. And that would automatically deport the person to slightly to one side of the, of the camera and looking to the other. Um, I'll talk about that in a, a little bit more depth in a minute. And this is the result in the video form. Here you have the opportunity to talk to other women who may who you may not meet because they're from all over the world basically and you can talk about your passion which is tech. Okay. Um, a first rule for you guys, the rule of thirds, and I, we joked about this with Suzanne and Jenny, who've, uh, who've seen one of my presentations before and who've applied this very religiously now. Uh, 
but it does actually help. Um, and it helps for recording video. It helps even in, in a kind of a, a video conferencing kind of scenario where you just want to angle, you know, your image, your, your laptop right, so that you you're sitting well in the picture. Um, so this is the general rule. It's called the rule of thirds. It's quite simple. Uh, basically, you're just splitting your screen in three, both uh, vertically and horizontally. Okay. Um, if you want to, well, first of all, of all, I'll give you an idea of why this is important because. As you can see here, the person is framed well, and her eye line is just about level with that top line. Okay, her eye line is level with the top horizontal line. That's that should be your your rule, um, and the person is centered between the two vertical lines. And in this case, and this is kind of a mistake, a rookie mistake that I was making a lot when I first shot video, you know, four or five years ago. Um, I tended to want to center the person's face absolutely and you know, to make sure that person was really locked into the center of the screen and you end up having too much headroom up here um, and it's not really what you want so it's almost counterintuitive but you want the person's head to be fairly high in the picture and the the gaze the eye line to be right here on this uh, top line imaginary line but which you can uh, um, actually activate if you use your phone uh, if you're on Android, you can um, activate grid lines here. It says grid lines three by three, that's for Android. And it'll give you those lines on your phone so you can actually practice yourselves and see what that looks like when you're, when you're framing subjects or, or whatever. Um, same thing for iPhone. Well, for, on iPhone, it's a little bit different. You need to go into settings first and then camera and then toggle uh, grid here. And you'll see that, that three by three grid. Um, but so as I was saying, these are the two key important kind of uh, intersections on this grid where uh, your subject's eye line should be either in the middle here or to one side um, near this intersection or near one of these intersections. Here's an example with the grid lines and without of, uh, of good acceptable framing. Um, yeah, going back to the scenario where you're looking off camera, you see what's happening here? So the, the, the subject is near this intersection over here. Okay, so you don't need to be, you know, really uh, rigorously on this grid line. You just need to be near, slightly above, slightly below is perfectly acceptable, but you need to be in this area rather than centrally. Um, what ends up happening is the mouth is more central than the, the eye line. So the outline should be around this line, and in this case, near this intersection here, because the subject is looking left. <clears throat> Excuse me. Subject is looking left, which is what we call long side. Okay. So if your subject is deported to the right, you want her to be looking left, and um, vice versa. If she's off to the left, you want her to be close to this intersection, and looking long side to the right. This is important, and it's a, it's it's also a common rookie mistake when you try and get the subject looking off camera, um, you end up in a situation like this. If you, if you get it wrong, your subject is looking short side over here, um, which feels odd because half of your image is kind of lost over here. This is kind of dead space. And you get this feeling that the subject doesn't really know, isn't really aware even of what's happening back here. So this is off. You want it to be the other way around, something more like, um, sorry, more like this. Um, with the with the subject is looking long side rather than short side, but just to show you an example, I use this uh, scene from um, the movie Drive, just to give you a counter example where you see that this is actually fine and working perfectly fine because there was something in the narrative of the film. There's this big exit sign here, and there's light also. There's a light source coming in from the back here, so this is artistically uh, pleasing as a composition, and there's this forward movement as well. And I think that in the movie, if I recall, uh, Ryan Gosling was probably settling a score or going to visit someone. Um, and it was quite an important scene. And in his mind, he's still back here kind of thing. He's just still thinking about where, about the scene that just unfolded before. Uh, and that's why that makes sense to have this kind of short side uh, framing in this case. So you can see that in some cases it works, in some cases it doesn't. But in the talking heads kind of static format like this, you can't really pull it off. Um, so just to recap, you can see the two 
comparisons, correct on the left, incorrect on the right. Uh, another good way to look at it is that you want your camera, len your lens, which is focusing here on this middle point of your screen, to cross the gaze of the person who's looking alongside. If you find your camera doing this and the person looking to the other side and there's no, no intersection between these two lines, then you end up with a situation where this is all dead space um, and it will feel off. Another important tip, I think, and this applies to video conferencing as well, if you're angling your laptop, if you're just using, typically if you're using a laptop and you rest it on a desk um, before you, it'll be, it'll be too low um, because your laptop camera will just be on your laptop face looking up to you and you'll end up in a situation like, uh, like this where you're, you might see the ceiling General rule of thumb, if you see the ceiling in the image, it's probably not a good idea. It's probably that your, your, your angle, your camera angle is too, uh, is too high. So uh, what, you, what you might want to do is just get some books or dictionary or something to raise your laptop so that it's at eye level um, rather than down here. Um, if you don't mind, let's play a little bit on these notions. So I, I, hopefully I've covered the three basics of lighting, background, and framing. Uh, and just to see if these notions are uh, clear to you guys, we can, we can have, a little, uh, have a little quiz to make it more interactive and more fun. Um, so you just have to kind of say, what's wrong with these pictures? Uh, is it... Is it um, I'll just wait for you guys to connect on the Menti. So I'll show you a series of pictures and you can look at them and say, just tell me if it's lighting, background or framing that's off or that's a problem, or if all is good, and in which case you can choose the, the, the last option. This isn't a contest, there's no leaderboard, don't worry. So what went wrong? Ah, different opinions, but mostly background. I would agree, background was the main uh, the main offender in this case. But yeah, it it could be. I I'd agree that, that lighting wasn't great either. Um, so there there can be multiple uh, good answers here. The rule of thirds here. Yeah, it's a short side problem framing where the, the, the character is looking short side rather than long side. Definitely framing, I think, would be the main issue here. He was very low in the picture. Correct. This is a uh, quite a nice composition. I wouldn't uh, fault it. It's subjective, of course. I mean, I'd understand maybe some of you don't like this, but generally speaking, this was a uh, was an acceptable composition.
Yep, the subject was backlit. In this case, you want to avoid being backlit when you're on a Zoom call. If you're paying attention, you will recognize this one from earlier on in the presentation. Yeah, this is all, all good in my opinion as well. Yeah, I agree. I think the lighting is the, the problem in this case. And finally, which are correct out of these pictures? Nice. Well done, guys. You're masters. I don't need to elaborate any more on this. Um, just yeah, to recap. So I think the two on the right were, were quite good. Not much to fault there. Here, he was uh, the subject is looking short side rather than long side. And in this case, um, you can see it's kind of it's probably a ceiling lighting top down that's giving this kind of ugly shadow around the the eye sockets and the, under the neck here, which is not, not great. And in this case, it was indeed one and four so that you have long side uh, framing. Um, back quickly to the Mentimeter. I wanna ask you guys what annoys you most on video calls video conferencing and, and webinars is it people who join late background noise people who leave their camera off and some children or when people eat what do you think what really gets to you great so mostly background noise uh, which is what I wanted to hear because it conveniently brings me to my next topic, which is audio. Audio should not be underestimated in video. It's, it's it, in fact, arguably, and this is maybe counterintuitive, but in some instances, audio is practically more important than video, um, than the, the, the picture on screen. Um, to help your audio no end, um, you want to use earbuds or AirPods or any kind of, uh, um, earphones that you might have uh, cabled, wired with a little microphone is better than no microphone at all um, because if it's just your laptop picking up the, the your laptop's mic picking up the sound it's not going to be great you're going to get some echo um, so this is really a, 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 an easy way to, to level up in terms of audio um, another good option is to look at these lavalier mics these little clip mics uh, uh, that you see in TV studios they're now actually very affordable you can get them for, for as little as twenty dollars up to or up to fifty dollars depending on the model but they're really quite affordable and they, they as we'll see in a minute they, they make quite a difference um, this is an example of, of um, what we call a shotgun microphone which is also a good accessory um, this is like a vlogger a vlogging kind of setup where you have a little what we call a gorilla pod, I'll get to that in a minute, and a shotgun microphone on your phone. And it's good for proximity, it will improve your sound uh, in this kind of proximity scenario. If you pull away from the phone too much, it's not gonna work as well. We'll have a listen. Uh, 
let's have a, a listen right now just to see the comparison in this video. And so right now I'm about a foot away from the mic or from the phone. There's no mic attached to it. So this is what it sounds like without any kind of mic. So I'm going to step away and then keep talking and then we'll see how great the sound is. So again, I am here now. Hello. So I five feet away. So this is not using a mic. Now we'll see with a. So now I'm going to use the video micro, the road video micro. So this is attached now to my phone and I know it's you working. You can see the so difference. Here I am about a foot away. Actually, I just noticed I still have my badge on. Well, um, so about rather. a foot away. And now I am five feet away. So this is what it sounds like when I have, I would say this is the maximum distance that works any further than this. It's yeah, so it doesn't work so well, I'd say, even from five feet. Uh, it's really a proximity mic rather than a, than anything else. It's almost pointless to be using a shotgun mic, but I'm going to do it anyway. So I'm here about 10 feet away, and I don't know what that sound like. Probably not amazing. And finally, probably the best option is the clip lavalier microphone I was telling you about earlier. Have a, have a listen to this. It sounds really good. So now I have a lavalier mic right here attached to me and I'm the same distance away. I'm guessing this sounds a little bit better. Anyway, so this is how it sounds being this close. And then this is probably going to perform the best when I'm farthest. So I'm guessing. All right. So you can see that the options you have in terms of, of audio um, that really can make, a, make quite a difference. On uh, stabilization, I'll just say a few things very quickly. Anything that you have, any kind of accessory that you have to prop up and hold up your phone is better than holding it with your hands because um, because if you're holding it with your with your hands, you'll always have a jit the jitters a little bit, the shakes. you know you, you'll shake a lot more um, uh, using one or both hands rather than having kind of just any kind of stick. Uh, and I'll show you some options. Um, there is, of course, the selfie stick, but if you, you can also snatch up uh, what we call a gorilla pod um, for as little as $10, uh, which you can see on the left here, it's propped up on, on some books. If you stack up some books, use a gorilla pod on a desk, you'll be, you can be kind of level, eye level to, uh, to get a good, a good shot of someone. Um, the neat thing about these gorilla pods is that they have these flexible uh, feet that you can pull up in, in any kind of position. And, and as I was saying earlier, if you can even use that to hold up your phone just with one hand, and you'll get a you'll get more reach as well, slightly, and a better grip, and uh, you'll a, a, a more stable shot. Uh, and you can get creative with uh, these things as well and put them in unusual places. Um, the gimbal is kind of a three-point axis stabilizer that pans and tilts, and it's it, you, it has these motorized. Um, uh, it, yeah, it's motorized on three axes, which is quite handy, especially if you're shoot, shooting action. Um, but maybe it might be overkill if you're just shooting yourself or something more static uh, in the picture. Uh, but once again, this this setup is quite a, a handy kind of combo of having a shotgun mic and just a gorilla pod for more stability. And now I'm going to get to this chapter I call asynchronous video communication. Um, now it sounds it sounds fancy, but essentially what we're having right here in this uh, web this go to webinar set format, sorry, uh, is a synchronous kind of kind of video communication. Uh, asynchronous is simply using the same tools, but recording video. Um, for further for for, what, for delayed watching, so to speak, or for creating a video message or a video presentation. Uh, <clears throat> and I'm going to get into some of the tools and software that we can use to 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 do that. Um, Zoom is uh, an obvious candidate. You can also use something called Loom. So don't confuse that with Zoom. Um, Loom is really handy. I use it sometimes because 
it does it doesn't require a download and you can actually just have it as an extension in your browser i use i use chrome and i have a loom extension so i just click on that little button in my browser and it opens up uh my loom interface but we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute um and the the, the last uh, option uh which maybe should can be your first option actually depending it's kind of the ugly duckling here it's powerpoint i mean this is maybe surprising to some but um you should consider that you can make video with powerpoint if you know you don't have any other options or if you're if you if you're lacking resources or time um or you just don't want to get into the learning curve that that might be involved with some other options um powerpoint could be a basic solution uh, but first of all, before before I get into those three solutions for recording video, uh, why does it make sense to use a laptop rather than a, than a phone? Um, well, there are lots of reasons today, especially with uh, uh, the options that are now available to us, is that you get better stability than with a phone, obviously, because you, you, your laptop is just sitting on your desk. Uh, you might just want to raise it, as I was saying, because here, in this case, you can see that it's kind of low compared to the, to the person over here. So um, it's a good idea to raise it so that the if you if you're using the onboard camera that it's kind of eye level rather than lower um another good reason to use a laptop is uh that you get light um from your from your office environment or your desktop so you have more light options than you do with your phone there's the battery life and ram uh, more storage uh, capacity than on your phone and your files can easily be uploaded or shared or transferred directly from your laptop onto the cloud or wherever for further further editing so a bunch of reasons why it makes sense to to, to go this way rather than uh, with your phone probably for for recording your videos um the only thing i'd say is to really up your game is to maybe invest in a better webcam than your onboard webcam and that can be as i was saying i'm using a dslr camera but you can also buy one of these uh usb webcams uh, and then look at maybe buying a USB microphone that plugs into your laptop directly as well. That will uh, improve your sound no end. Uh, and they come in all sorts of fancy designs now and at different price points, but they do really make a difference. Uh, back to the software. So let's let's look at PowerPoint first, and then uh, and then Zoom, and then finally Loom as as three options for asynchronous video. Um, I have this little PowerPoint screen grab that I made. So if you open PowerPoint, um, you can see, uh, well, let me just share this video with you. It'll kind of speak for itself, but uh, inside PowerPoint, you go into slideshow mode. Um, and if you click on slash slideshow, you can enable the recording. A record slideshow i think is the option and then you can activate your webcam you see my webcam is active bottom right uh, and then you can just go through the slideshow and, and record audio and video to your slideshow and export that as an mp4 so as a standard video file an mp4 format so that's maybe one good option to look at if if your content is essentially a powerpoint presentation but that not might not be the case always you might want to go beyond PowerPoint, which is, of course, limiting. Uh, and if, if that's the case, um, let's look at Zoom. This is, quote, every age has its storytelling form, and we're very much in the Zoom age uh, because of what, you know, what's been going on in the last 12 months. And some producers have really taken that in their stride and, and found ways of being creative. You know, creativity comes from using your limitations in, in one way or another. and for video producers the limitations was were, were very much well we can't travel we can't uh, set up our gear um in, in different locations and and so we everything's happening online through zoom anyway so let's make the most of it and so this is what they've um they've done with uh i want to show you this, this example of what some producers have done which uh, with something which is essentially a zoom call between Bill Gates and uh, the NBA star Stephen Curry and they tried to set up this kind of pastiche Kind of remote interview on zoom except that they produced it in a way that really makes it um take on a different dimension hi hi i'm bill how you doing bill Stefan? nice to meet you thank you so much for doing this if you don't mind i want to ask you you know a couple of the uh, you google the top 10 
interview questions and see uh, if you can give us some insight. Is that all right? Love to. Yeah. Let's say you're interviewing for a junior engineer position at Microsoft, sitting in a boardroom or on video call uh, in 2020. Why should we hire you? You should look at the code that I've written. You know, I'm kind of crazy. I write software programs way beyond any classes that I've taken and think I've gotten better over time. So take a look at how ambitious I've been there. I do think I can work well with people. I might criticize their code a little harshly, but overall, I like to be on a team. I like ambitious goals. I like thinking through how we can anticipate the future. Software is cool. Okay, so um, a lot to unpack there, but you see all these different shots they were using. So on the, on the, the right over here, you have these two camera angles or camera shots. Now, these are high-end cameras, which give you a nice picture, but essentially, they they are substitutes for what would be your webcam, right? So this looks like Bill Gates's front view of his webcam. This is uh, Stephen Curry's. And then they've added other cameras in the room. So on, on Gates's side, they put a camera here, which is kind of three quarters. On Curry's side in his, uh, in his gym, he's this kind of a full profile shot over here, which complement the, the, what we'll call the zoom cameras. And this is what we call an establishing shot, which is very important because it gives you the context. It's it's the shot that shows the two protagonists together, uh, and where you, as a viewer, get the impression that they're actually ha you know having a conversation, almost like they're in the same room. Uh, it's important to show an establishing shot like this because if you're just showing uh, isolated people in your in your edit, your video edit. Uh, you won't get that feel a feel for that connection and it'll just feel kind of weird whereas the establishing shot really makes it clear what's going on and gives you more context um but so yeah i think this is a good example it really opened my eyes as to what was possible just with you know as a kind of uh, an enhanced zoom call so to speak and this is just picture in picture so where they split the screen and showed a uh, showed both in a, kind of a fifth uh, angle um, Loom, as I was saying earlier, just an extension in your browser. It's very handy. You just click on that extension, and it'll, it'll, this, this little window will pop up and ask you, do you want to record screen and camera, uh, screen only, or camera only? Um, and then you, this is kind of your end result. Will look something like this, where you, you have your video on the left, uh, in a kind of circular stamp kind of format. Um, your audio is th through your microphone, and then you could be browsing showing any kind of a website, uh, any online content, sharing your screen essentially. So it's a little bit more, it, it gives you a little bit more options than just recording in PowerPoint. Now, finally, I'd, I'd like to wrap up with just uh, making a video for you guys. I did this a few days ago um, in a matter of, of hours. So just to show you what's possible um, in terms of really making a video from A to Z, uh, with what we call A roll, B roll, and graphics. Now, the the point of this exercise for me was to try and do it entirely with free software and free tools. Okay, so I was trying to figure out how I could how I could relate my experience of of making video um, because we use a lot of software that's that's quite pricey as well. If you get if you go down the Adobe route, you kind of you're tied down to kind of a, a monthly memberships and that kind of thing. And I wanted to see if it was possible to share with you. Uh, or to do the exercise of making a video from from scratch with all only free tools using only free tools and and what I had you know my phone and that kind of thing. So uh, hopefully you'll like the results and it it might give you some ideas as to what's possible. So please don't judge me on the content here. Um, let's just look at the form. Uh, that's what's important. Um, let's see if I can. Here we go. What happens when a green activist gets all his facts wrong about an old chestnut tree? Sadly, an old European chestnut tree will need to be felled in the park opposite my apartment. It has been attacked by a common parasitic fungus and suffers from a disease commonly known as chestnut blight. The fungus enters through wounds on susceptible trees and grows in beneath the bark. Distinctive yellow tendrils can be seen in places. European chestnut trees grow to a height of about 20 to 35 meters and otherwise live up 
to about 300 years on average. Interestingly, a green activist in the neighborhood spread misinformation in the form of a flyer, which claims that the tree is to be cut down to make way for a new public transport line, while also generously adding 100 years to the actual age of the tree, stating that it was 300 years old rather than 183. And that's it for this episode of Don't Believe the Hype. There you go. That's my that's my production. I hope you liked it. Uh, just to show you, so this was recorded here uh, in my in my at my office in my studio. So with this microphone, which I have, which is which is helpful in terms of the sound, um, and as I said, my my camera over here. But it could just as easily be done with a webcam um, and any kind of, you know earphones or any kind of a wired mic that you have at your disposal. Um, let's unpack and see what's what's going on here. So this, uh, what you can see here is actually the video editor. The software I use is called Shotcut. Okay, so I was really looking out for, sorry, for, um, for free software. It's available for Mac and PC and it's free. So have a look at it. Um, it's also kind of a stripped down version of some more complex video editors. So it's helpful because the learning curve is not so, so steep. Um, and your screen real estate is less cluttered. So let's see what's going on here. So this is my video down here. It's what we call the, the timeline. So I was saying earlier that I, I come from a kind of music background and I was producing music. If any of you have an affinity with music, it's the same kind of thing. Uh, a music editor will look the same way because you're, you're sequencing bits like le Lego bricks that you're adding to your, to your mix. Okay. So, First of all, let's talk about what we call the A roll is my main shot, just of me delivering my message over here. And that's on one track down here, okay? And I brought that, I just recorded that with uh, my onboard kind of uh, quick time on my Mac, but you can use any kind of native uh, video recording uh, tool on PC and um and get this kind of result with your, your video and audio on a separate track over here so what you have to do is decouple the video from the audio to have to have them on two tracks okay that's that's basically the bulk of what you uh, uh, it's the backbone of your video um so just a little bit of on a roll the way to do that is you want to write your script just a rule of thumb also 130 words like in a word doc a uh, Word document, a text file, 130 words will equate to about one minute of video. So if you're going for a three minute video presentation, you want to have around 500 words kind of thing. Um, after that, I, I fed my script into a free browser based teleprompter. Uh, it's called zq.com, which I think I have right here as well. Um, so this is browser based, feed your text into that, and then you start it and you see the text scrolls and you can just read it out. And if your camera is close enough to your screen, that's what you want to do because you want to give the impression that you're still looking into. Um, you want to give the impression that you're still looking into your camera and have your your prompter just below below your camera, which will be the case if you're using your onboard webcam on your laptop. You can have your your prompter just kind of scrolling underneath, and and, and it'll be convincing enough. Um, so yeah, that's the queue, my free teleprompter where I put my, my text in. Um, then you record yourself with PC webcam, uh, or optionally, as I said, you can use an external camera or external microphone, and just with your native camera app on PC, QuickTime or Mac. Um, and then you open the file with your video editor. In this case, I was using Shotcut, uh, but you can, you can use Adobe Premiere as well as another option. Uh, so that's for the A roll. Now for the B roll, let's just go back to the let's go back to the video just a second. Fungus and suffers from a disease. See, so this is my B roll. Uh, this I just went out to the park. As I was saying, it was just across the street from where I live. It was a beautiful, crisp winter morning, and I just I just pulled out my iPhone and I was I shot some. Uh, 
some b-rolls to some some different angles i got close up near the tree a little bit further it, it has been attacked by a um and the european chestnut tree will need to be felled in the park opposite my apartment it has been attacked by a common parasitic fungus okay so those shots were just shot with the phone and um then if you see here on the timeline once again in the in the editor they're layered up here they're all over um sorry just to, you can see my 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 pointer you can probably see my mouse now so the the b-roll is up here what ends up happening is when you this is called a playhead in the video editor when you when you hit play the playhead will move across and it'll always it'll play the A roll first, but whatever's laid on top of it will get played, um, and sort of mask this. So you only see the A roll when it's alone, but whenever there's something on top of it, that's what's what gets played. All right. So as I was saying, for B roll, I just snap video with the phone. You can also screen capture documents on your on your PC. Uh, images online from your files, whatever you have available, you can just throw that into a video editor on top of your your main uh, your main track, uh, and you'll create a new track in your video editor project and layer the B-roll above your A-roll. Uh, and finally, the third element in this, and just a very very basic video, are the graphics that you may have seen at the beginning and at the end. Um, it's kind of what I call a little stinger. Let's just show show you that again. It was at the all the way at the beginning. Actually, it's not it's not completely at the beginning. I I give kind of a a brief intro, and then I move to my jingle stinger, and then back into the video. That that's a little trick. It gives you more a more dynamic feel than if you opened with the the intro directly. So you just want to appear yourself, give a short statement as an intro, and then break into your your jingle. What happens when a green activist gets all his facts wrong about an old chestnut tree? <laughs> Sadly, an old so that was that was my um, my jingle. And how did I produce that? Well, I was using a free tool as well um, that I call it's called Canva, C A N V A. And this is really a dream. Uh, it's the it's the graphics tool for non designers. So if you if you if you have no design design background or experience, you don't need to open up Photoshop even or Illustrator or any of this stuff, just go to Canva. It's all online, so there's no download, and you can just create your create your title frames and, and text frames like this uh, over here. So I just found this picture, created my little text frame, and then I can animate it. Um, let's see how. Yeah, so you have these different kind of. You can make it just fade in, or I think I had this effect. In my intro. But uh, yeah, anything's anything's possible. It's a great tool, Canva.com, and um, there's a there's a pro uh, plan as well. But even with the free plan, you can do quite a lot. And so that's layered over here. As I was saying, uh, you see, I have my intro first for about five seconds. I open with the statement, and then I have my little stinger. And there's some music that goes with it, which is down here. You can see the music is synced with the that little stinger. And then uh, back to my A roll and B roll until the end, and I conclude with the stinger again. And that's it. So there's not much to it. It's just uh, one, two, three. It's three video tracks and two audio tracks. One for the main narrative, my voice, and the other one is just the that little music stinger that appears at the beginning at the end. So that's very in a nutshell. That's how you produce video uh, for free. So graphics, as I was saying, Canva, check it out. Really, really helpful. Um, now, I think we're going to probably wrap up because we only have about 10 more minutes. Uh, just one more thing I want to show you, a quick, a tr uh, sorry, a quick trick about A-roll and B-roll. So have a look at these two versions of, um, of these, uh, this video. First, this one, you'll notice a lot of hesitations in my in my voice. 
The new president of the Tokyo Olympic Organizing Committee has hinted that um, foreign fans will not uh, be allowed at this summer's games amid reports in the Japanese press that a decision had already been made to keep them out. So you notice how much I was hesitating in that take, uh, going uh, mm, a lot of uh, a lot of hesitations and pauses in my voice. If uh, you compare that to this one here, now this is the same take. I didn't re-record this. It's the same audio, but just cleaned up. Have a look. The new president of the Tokyo Olympic Organizing Committee has hinted that foreign fans will not be allowed at this summer's games amid reports in the Japanese press that a decision had already been made to keep them out. You see what happened there is um, I was able to shorten the video by two seconds and, and kind of clean out those little hesitations. And the, the way to do that is with B-roll actually. So uh, let me just show you, it'll be more easy to, it'll be, sorry, easier to understand if I show you this shot here. Um, the timeline over here. So you see, this is my A-roll where I was talking about the, the Tokyo Olympics with my, the sound of my voice. I decoupled the audio so that it's on a separate audio track over here. And I was laying over the B-roll over here at this point. So this is where the B-roll comes in. And notice what I did here is my hesitations were all around here. They were in this area. So I went in and edited, edited them out. I cut them out and did some cross fades and that kind of thing just to clean up the audio here. But what that does is it'll, it will mean that I'm out of sync with my video file because my, my lips won't move at the same speed um, because I've kind of doctored the audio here. So it kind of puts everything off kilter. But that's not a problem if you have a if you have a B-roll that's laid over. It's kind of like masking tape. You have to think of B-roll as masking tape in this case, and you just cut to this shot of uh, uh, these insert uh, kind of aerial footage and whatever shots from Tokyo. And while the voice is still going on, so this is seamless. And then over here, I'm back in sync. So I did a little edit in the video just to bring this back in sync, and so that when I, when I come out of the B-roll, uh, everything is fine again. So that's a neat little trick that uh, you don't necessarily need to re-record your audio if it's not perfect. You can use B-roll to just make sure that uh, it's clean and seamless. And just to conclude rapidly, so this is kind of everything we've covered today. Um, and I want to show you what it, you know, just so that you kind of print this in your minds. That video is a lot of different components. And what you need essentially, first of all, I think is to look at lighting, background, and framing. These three kind of more uh, these three concepts that are very important, I think, to, to kind of internalize um, and process, um, and they make up a good chunk of what your how you know what your video will end up looking like and the quality. Then there's audio, which I think is again, as I said before, it can't be overstated uh, how how important it is. In some cases, more important than the picture itself. So you want your audio to be clean. Then there's video, obviously, and the last thing is confidence. And I say this mostly for um, when you're shooting someone else, another subject, you'll notice that people aren't necessarily comfortable in front of the camera, and this, but this can apply to yourself if you're recording video for the first time as well. And you wanna be confident um, because that will, uh, there's an element of performance in video. Uh, it's not just using the right tools, that there is an element of performance that's important. And in fact, it's the most critical thing. You want the performance to be good and then everything else will shine. And in order to do that, you need to be confident with the tools you're using um, in the case of recording a video message yourself while using something like the prompter that I showed you earlier is great because it, it'll boost your confidence no end. Uh, it'll just make it much more comfortable for you to just read out your script and not have to worry about what you're trying to say while you're recording, et cetera. Um, so there are things that, that can help there uh, with, with confidence building. But these are essentially, you know, it's the sum of all parts that will make a good video. And hopefully um, I have given you some tips in that direction and you can learn from from my experience and that's it for me i will happily uh, take on some questions suzanne if we have time still for for some questions and if they came in we do have some time john and uh, we've actually had quite a few questions so i think 
we start and see how far we get. Uh, a first question that came in from Sherlyn Fu is uh, whether it's better to use a virtual background for recording. What is your suggestion? Um, it kind of depends on what you're what you're trying to project or what your what the content of your presentation is. But um, generally speaking, if you if you can afford the luxury of being in a nice room with good lighting and the background is not too close, you the back wall is not too close to you. Um, I would go natural it, because because if you move a little bit around, you know those virtual backgrounds on Zoom they're getting quite good, but they still kind of outline your shape and they, they yeah. Um, and in some cases they can kind of detract from what your main subject is and what your topic is and what you're trying to convey as a message. So uh, I'm in two minds. Another thing you can consider, um, but this is if you, your video is going to be edited by someone else, and I just want to throw it out there because we've done it with some clients, is to use a green, a virtual green background. Um, so it's just a green image, a bright green lime image that you put as your virtual background, and that allows the editors to just strip out the background completely and have you isolated and then bring in whatever kind of presentations, PowerPoints, or create a whole environment, an animation around you and just sort of inserting you as a character inside the animation. So that's possible as well. But um, depends on what you're trying to do. Uh, those three options are available, virtual background, green back, virtual green background, or going natural. Um, as, I, as I was saying, I, I think I'd prefer natural if, it's, uh, if you can afford it, if, you, if your room allows it. But otherwise, yeah. Thanks, John. There's a question here from Edgar Namoro, and uh, he's asking whether you can recommend an app for noise cancellation. Um, hmm. That's tricky because noise cancellation, if you're talking about noise cancellation in a synchronous video setting, like, for example, what we're having here, um, the, the the platforms take care of that themselves. Zoom has, for example, if you are using Zoom, you can go into your settings and your audio settings and you can enable noise cancellation to, to different degrees. So it can be more or less sensitive. Uh, and other platforms have that option as well. If you're recording a video message uh, or presentation yourself, um, it's kind of, there are two ways to do it. You can do it at the source, or you can do it in when you're mixing your video, when you're when you're kind of uh, producing it in the the software. Um, the best is always to have the best sound at the source, so you don't have to, you know, you don't end up trying to correct that in the mix. But to get the best sound at the source, you want to use, as I was saying, a microphone that's cabled, um, a wide microphone, any kind of microphone, rather than your laptop's mic, which will be picking up, or your phone mic, which will be picking up more background noise uh, as I, th I think I've shown in some of the examples on audio so if you have a dedicated mic that's probably your best option to, to, to remove noise rather than uh, using software okay thanks John um, there's a question from Muhammad um, Ikwan Idris and he is wondering whether you have any advice on how to increase human presence in asynchronous videos hmm that's that's a very good question. <laughs> How to increase human presence in asynchronous videos? Um, well, I think that kind of boils down to I'm not exactly sure how, what kind of format or how some of the videos of the researchers that are that are listening today, what kind of videos they're they're going to produce and what what kind of tone of voice they'd be going for. But to, to increase the human presence, I think they can only just uh, really bank on the the confidence I, I was talking about. If you if you're confident, um, and you project that confidence and the kind of joy of what you're trying to present, that's the best way to to, to add the human presence. Um, you can also, I suppose, use something like short interview snippets of other people. If you want, if you're collecting testimonials, uh, you can increase the human presence by just going out with your phone and collecting short testimonials and adding them to your video. That sort of thing. Um, yeah, it's probably a, it's a vast question, I guess. Human experience, a human. How do you give a human touch to a video? 
but essentially by appearing yourself on video uh, rather than just audio or um, yeah, just laying your voice over a PowerPoint presentation, that will help probably. Thanks so much. Um, we have a question from uh, Dr. Jibi. Hi, Jibi, who, who's joining us from France, but she's from Thailand. And uh, Jibi has a question about audio. So she wonders, would you record audio in a separate device or right on the camera? What would you have the Lavalier mic connected to? And how can you master a perfect audio when you're filming yourself on your own? Um, those are, yeah, those are very good questions. And um, essentially the answer, the short answer is yes, uh, to record the audio separately is better. Um, it's a good idea that you even bring it up. That's probably, that means that you've thought about it or that you've researched it. And if you can, I would do that. So you can, you can, you can plug the lavalier into a uh, kind of a, I use a Tascam field recorder. I'm not sure. I, if you give me a minute, I actually have it here. Hang on a sec. So I have um, this, which is just a, a field monitor recorder task, made by Tascam. Uh, and it's like a dedicated recorder and you can plug in um, your 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 lavalier microphone into that directly otherwise uh plugging it into your phone will work as well but the the advantage of record, recording in a dedicated device is you get a little bit you can get a slightly better quality and um you don't have the storage problem of recording onto your phone uh it's more easily to tr it's easier to transfer your sound file up to for video editing afterwards as well so there are some advantages to recording audio separately. Um, typically, if you're recording a Zoom, we didn't really touch upon Zoom interviews too much, but you can record a whole interview, well, a little bit like the Bill Gates Curry video I shared with you. You'll notice, or you will have noticed that they were using external mics and that the sound was really good. If you're doing a video interview over Zoom yourself with someone, uh, you can do the exercise um, that if you're recording it, to record the audio on your side, so to have to use even your phone um, and a lavalier microphone, for example, connected to your phone, and to use that while you're having the Zoom call. And then when the Zoom call is, is finished, if it, if it would be packaged and recorded by whoever is recording it, you can just send your your sound file. This is what podcasters do, for example. They, they connect on Zoom, but they're each recording their audio to their phones with just a little clip lavalier microphone to get really good quality. And then they send their audio to the whoever's editing the video or the podcast. Uh, and that way, the podcast is not suffering from Zoom quality audio where you know how Zoom kind of identifies the speaker and then puts that person on and it can cut occasionally cut the, the audio from one or the other because it's, you get competing audio coming in and Zoom has to choose, decide who's, you know, who, who trumps who. Um, it's the same as with the GoToWebinar, any, any of these platforms. So in this case, it's, it's really helpful and improves your audio to record it separately. It's really a, a good scenario where recording your audio separately and sending it to the video editor will, will, uh, will be very helpful. Thanks, John. I think we have time for three more questions. So the first one is again from Sherlyn Poo, and she's wondering if you are also recording your slides, how do you use the teleprompter since your screen is also being recorded? What, what's your advice here? Yeah, uh, in this scenario where I was using the teleprompter, and I think in any, in any scenario where you want to use the teleprompter, it's a two-step process in that case. Um, with some of the first examples I was showing in Zoom, Loom, or PowerPoint, uh, and I, sh I, didn't, I didn't really uh, specify or expand on that too much, but those solutions allow you to record your video in one take so to speak, and there's no further editing. So it's really kind of no learning curve, very easy access uh, and, and, and quite simple for every, anyone to step into where um, you just this kind of plug and play and you're recording. And then you, when, when it's ended, you might just trim your video at the beginning or the end, but Loom and PowerPoint will give you kind of a finished product. With the, the A to Z example that I was sharing with you, 
uh, it's more of a uh, you know three-stage process where you uh, rec well you you script, you feed your script into the teleprompter, you record, and then you go to the editing. And the third stage is going into the editing where you kind of uh, bring everything together. Um, so if you are going to do that and you 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 would bring up your teleprompter in that stage of the process where you, you're writing your script and you record that. So it's just your teleprompter, you looking into the camera and recording that, and then that, that generates your first video file. After that, you can do all sorts of things. You can look at your slides, you can you can add them to the mix, and you can re-record audio over them if you want. But um, I wouldn't attempt to try and uh, go through your slides with a prompter at the same time. I mean, you'd need multiple screens, but then you'd be looking from one to one side to the next, and you wouldn't be focused on your camera. So the, the short answer is take it in steps, and uh, if you and bring up the prompter just to record what what I call the A roll uh, video, and think of slides as B roll that you can record afterwards. Good, then we have our penultimate question from Satya Bhattivari. And uh, this participant wants to know, they have the idea of adding, I think, a song that is in YouTube as their audio. How would they add this as audio to their, to their video? Um, well, there, there are all sorts of implications. First of all, I have to point out that uh, you should just be mindful of copyright with uh, YouTube songs. Now, if it's if it's if the video will be shared internally only, if it's for internal use, I suppose you can get away with that, and I you don't have to worry about it too much. But it's just something that I wanted to point out that um, there can be copyright issues if you're if you're using YouTube commercial music uh, in a video that's shared publicly. Um, that's the first thing. But but otherwise. It's just a question of uh, going onto YouTube, and there's there's sites that are called, you know, if you just Google YouTube to MP3 uh, conversion, there are a number of sites that do it. All you do is you, you go to these sites, you enter the U YouTube URL uh, of the song, and then you hit download, and the site will just pull out the YouTube video uh, or the uh, and convert. Well, it'll just pull out the audio from the YouTube video and download it to your PC as an MP3 song, uh, an MP3 file, and from there, uh, it's just as I was showing you in my short little A to Z. There, you can just create an audio track and drop in your your song. Whether you're using Shotcut or if you iMovie, if you're on Mac, uh, you just drop in that MP3 file that you downloaded from YouTube. Okay, and then we come to the final question. I think this is an excellent question. Um, our audience members today are all researchers, so we have a question. Background noise. This is a question um, related to how could uh, researchers use visualizations, graphics in their video if they want to, you know, make an interesting video about their research. Would you have any advice how they could use, you know, any tools or applications to make this engaging visually, which is kind of difficult to do? What is your advice here? Yeah, um, yeah, very much so. It's a good question. And for researchers, uh, I touched upon it with Loom a little bit um, because Loom allows you to just screen capture. Um, but you can use, I think, onboard tools as well. Uh, I'm on Mac, so it's QuickTime. Uh, just to, so I'm not really sure what the equivalent is on PC, but it's natively you can just determine an area of your screen and just screen grab that. So if you have data vis visualization, um, be it static or animated, you can screen grab that and then use it as a video file. Uh, as, a, one of, as I was saying, one of your Lego bricks that you add to your to your presentation, to your mix. So is, once you, the, the key is to, to just screen capture, to figure that, figure that out and uh, to render that as an MP4 kind of video file or just as a PNG image, if it's just a static data visualization, um, and then to just import that PNG or MP4 into your uh, shortcut, uh, shortcut or whatever video editing software you're using as, as B-roll over your A-roll, which is your voice. I hope that makes sense. 
uh, it's difficult to sum up video editing in just a, uh, a very short answer, but the basics are there. Thanks so much, John. And thank you so much for taking the time to answering so many questions. I know that some of you have asked questions and we haven't responded to them. We will try to do so in writing. We will, as I said at yeah. the beginning, send a recording of the session uh, together with John's slides. And I'm sure that John will probably um, allow us to ask him some of the questions that were raised today and just provide some short answers, which we will share with you in the next couple of days together with your certificate of attendance. So don't worry, it will reach you possibly before the end of the week. John, thank you so much. But before we all go, I would like to just also invite my colleague, Dr. Jenny Almako, to just say a few words about Euraxis, the organization that Jenny and I are working for. And she will also tell you a little bit about the other activities that we have planned for you and of course all the other services that Euraxis provides to researchers here in Southeast Asia. Please Jenny. Yeah thank you Susan. So before you you all go thank you so much John for that. I mean we were we had John as a, as a trainer some some months back and uh, we really learned a lot and I think Susan and I tried to uh, to make sure that we we show today that we are we learn from him uh, just some 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 things some slides uh, just to remind all of you here you know this is not the only activity that we have uh, in your access um, this is the third actually of a series of our research career development uh, seminars you know specific to researchers so we your access as you know supports mobile researchers and we have a lot of things if i can just go to the next slide uh with this one okay it's not moving hmm. Okay, all right. So there's a job and funding portal. Uh, if you go to your access ASEAN, please take a look at that. Uh, we try to list every day and update every day. There are thousands of research fellowships and funding offers uh, in Europe for ASEAN researchers. There is also a partnering tool. So if you represent a research institution, please do check it out for a partnering tool. And then right now we actually have expressions of interest from universities who are eager to host you. So please take a look at that. We just had, we just posted one from the University of Malta. And in the next uh, weeks, we will be posting as well other host institutions. So if you are planning to apply for, let's say a postdoctoral fellowship on the Marie Curie, we will be posting also those EOIs for you. So pl please take a look at that. There's also a hosting database. If you want to host researchers in your institution, there's also a place where you can put that in. And of course, we have like a lot of uh, inf information. You know, we also have a YouTube channel that you can check out. This webinar will be in our YouTube channel. But of course, uh, for all of you who are inside our session, the great thing about it is not only are you able to interact with John and you know really ask the questions, but you also get a certificate. You know, so I think it's it's really a great thing. But for those who were unable to join us uh, today, there will be a uh, we will make it into a learning tool and it will be available on our YouTube channel. Of course, we provide also personalized assistance. So there are Euraxis service centers in 36 European countries and in, here in Euraxis ASEAN, it is me and Susan. So if you have questions, uh, please email us at ASEAN at Euraxis.net and please follow also our all our social media accounts. So for those of you who are very active on social media, please do use our hashtag uh, for this series, hashtag Euraxis ASEAN for researchers. Uh, our Twitter account is Euraxis ASEAN. Our Facebook is Euraxis ASEAN as well. And of course, if you are, uh, if you can uh, scan the QR code, all of the information is there. So please uh, sign up for for our activities. The next one is very interesting. It is on uh, on IP, so intellectual uh, property when it comes to uh, research. Uh, that will be on the 15th and uh, we will keep you updated also on the other activities that are that are coming there's also the meet my lab uh, coming up so those of you uh, who want to take a look uh, a bit closer about you know the kind of research that ASEAN researchers uh, in Europe are doing that's a really uh, great thing to follow as well so there's a series uh, we're having it first I think on the it's not on the 15th, Susan, but I will we'll send you after this email, we'll send all of these schedules for you, including your certificate. 
um, and also the the video of this seminar so that you can also share it to your uh, to your friends and to your colleagues. So please keep in touch with us. Uh, you learn a lot of things, and of course, you you meet you know amazing people just like John. And again, John, thank you so much for taking the time. So thank you so much, thank everyone. You, Yes, and with this, uh, once again, John, as I just quote one of our participants, amazing session. And as I said at the beginning, it's a hat trick in our series of career development for researchers in ASEAN. We see you again very soon. And once again, John, have a beautiful day in Brussels. I hope uh, it's not raining. It's, snow it's snowing in Brussels, believe it there or not. There you go, even better. <laughs> <laughs> we miss snow. We miss snow. Don't know what's, yeah, don't know what's everybody, happening. Everybody stay safe and we see you all very soon. Thank you so much and goodbye. Bye. Thank you everybody. Thanks. Goodbye. Take care. <laughs>